Let us pray. God, you have gathered us here for worship. Come and be among us as we sing, praise, learn, and grow. In Christ's name, amen. Please stand and join us for our first hymn, Brethren, We Have Met in Worship, hymn 396. Please don't forget to wear your mask if you're going to sing. I almost did that. <laughs> and I have forgotten mine, so I'm not singing. <laughs> for another glorious Sunday. I'm glad you all are here for uh, today. We have in the pulpit, by back by popular demand, Ultima. <laughs> we'll be leaving soon to go back to the Princeton Theological Seminary to complete his education for this past year. Um, just a couple of quick announcements. Next Sunday, as uh, we start the school year, we will have our blessing of the backpacks. So every student, bring in your backpack, uh, and we'll have a special uh, blessing during the 10 a.m. service. And just a reminder that the fall worship schedule and Sunday school begins September 11th. Uh, so we're gonna have come celebrate rally day with the start of Sunday school and the return to two worship services uh, at 9 a.m. and 11.15 on September 11th. And don't forget that we need people to make this worship happen. Sign up to run, to be an usher, to run the slides, or uh, you can have this wonderful opportunity to be a liturgist. So you email into the office and volunteer to be a liturgist. So now we, let's go 
with our first song there. That one? Absolutely. Please stand, everyone, if you can. down for the children's sermon. Good morning, good morning. Good morning, all right. It's good to see all of you here today. So today I wanted to talk with you about who God is. We hear preachers talk a lot about this in church. Pretty much every sermon you're going to hear somehow asks the question, who is God? But I thought, just us, just for fun, we could talk about how we know who God is. Because I think we often talk about that, and maybe you'd like to know how we know what we know. So when we talk about God, there are a couple ways we can know him, and it's almost like getting to know another person. So if you're trying to meet someone new, there's a couple of ways you can find out who they are, right? They can just tell you who they are. Hi, I'm Luke. I'm the preacher this morning. I go to Princeton Theological Seminary, 
and I don't like pickles or long boring meetings. There you go, I just told you who I was. Or you could hear stories or see how a person acts in the world. Your friend might tell you a story about how somebody else behaved. And maybe you can get to see what sort of a person they are by seeing how they act. God's done the same thing for us, showing Him who He is. The beautiful thing is that the Bible combines both ways of knowing who God is. There are parts of our Bible where God tells us just who He is. He says, I'm the resurrection and the life. I am the bread of heaven. I'm the true vine. And there are parts where he tells stories. And we get to learn from him that way. So when you're hearing sermons today or from Pastor Judith, you can ask yourself, how is God showing himself to me? How am I knowing all about this? That's just what I wanted to share with you today. It's so good to see you all here in the worship. Thank you so much for coming down here. Jordan, I think you can go to Godly Play if you want. The first reading today is from Jeremiah 1, 4 to 10. Now the word of the Lord came to me saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, and before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Then I said, Ah, oh, Lord God, truly I do not know how to speak, for I am only a boy. But the Lord said to me, Do not say, I am only a boy, for you shall go to all to whom I send you, and you shall speak whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Then the Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, Now I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up and pull down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. <clears throat> The second reading is from Hebrews 12, 18 to 29. You have, not <clears throat> you have not come to something that can be touched, a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest and the sound of a trumpet and a voice whose words made the hearers beg that not another word be spoken to them. For they could not endure the order that was given if even an animal touches the mountain, it shall be turned to stone. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. See that you do not refuse the one who is speaking, for if they did not escape when they refused the one who warned them on earth, how much less will we escape if we, re we reject the one who warns them from heaven? And at that time, his voice shook the earth. But now he has promised, yet once more I shall shake not only the earth, but also the heaven. This phrase, yet once more, indicates the removal of what is shaken. That is created thing, so that what cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us give thanks by which we offer to God an acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for indeed our God is a consuming fire. Our third reading today comes from Psalm 71, verses 1 through 6. In you, O Lord, I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. 
In your righteousness, deliver me and rescue me. Incline your ear to me and save me. Be to me a rock of refuge, a strong fortress to save me. For you are my rock and my fortress. Rescue me, O my God, from the hand of the wicked, from the grasp of the unjust and cruel. For you, O Lord, are my hope, my trust, O Lord, from my youth. Upon you I have leaned from my birth. It was you who took me from my mother's womb. My praise is continually of you. Our fourth and final reading today is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 13, verses 10 through 17. Listen now for the word of the Lord. Now he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And just then there appeared a woman with a spirit that had, been, that had crippled her for 18 years. She was bent over and was quite unable to stand up straight. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said, Woman, you are set free from your ailment. When he laid his hands on her, immediately she stood up straight and began praising God. But the leader of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had cured on the Sabbath, kept saying to the crowd, There are six days on which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be cured, and not on the Sabbath day. But the Lord answered him and said, You hypocrites! Does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it away to give it water? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for 18 long years, be set free from this bondage on the Sabbath day? When he said this, all his opponents were put to shame, and the entire crowd was rejoicing at the wonderful things that he was doing. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray together. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. May the gospel mean more to us than mere words. May the Holy Spirit produce in us strong conviction. Amen. I spoke about who we are in relation to God the last time I preached at Trinity. I focused on one text, Hosea 11, and looked at what it tells us about who we are and how we relate to God. Today I want to invert all of that. I want to preach on all four texts the lectionary gives us. <laughs> Every week, the lectionary has four texts. These are the ones that were chosen for today. And I want to preach on them because these texts, which seem so very different, unite to give us a sense of who God is in relation to us. These texts show how God has related to humanity throughout history and what that relationship has revealed about who God is. Yet the texts appear to speak about God differently. The unity I promised just a couple of sentences ago is hard won and only comes at the end of the sermon. So to understand who God is and to understand how these very different texts might be unified, we have to look at each one of them in turn. The first text we read was from Jeremiah a prophetic book. The text is the call story of the prophet Jeremiah. God calls him to be a prophet, Jeremiah refuses, and God, as always, gets his way. It's easy, and I think worthwhile, to get caught up in what Jeremiah's call story reveals about him. Yet I think the crucial thing is that this text reveals God wants to be in relationship with humanity. God commissions Jeremiah as a prophet so that God's word can be communicated to the nations. God commissions Jeremiah 
so he can speak to people through Jeremiah. Fundamentally, this text is about how God will do anything and use anyone, including an apprehensive boy, to be in relationship with humanity. Jeremiah also depicts God as the God of the nations. The text intentionally uses the plural here. It speaks of Jeremiah as a prophet to the nations, in verse 5, who is placed in a position of authority over the nations and the kingdoms, in verse 10. God's desire to relate to humanity doesn't stop with one person, Jeremiah, nor does it stop with one nation, Israel, but extends to every nation. God's desire to be in relationship with humanity extends to us as well. We read Hebrews next, but we may as well have read Exodus. Hebrews interacts with the Old Testament extensively, and this passage interprets Israel at Mount Sinai in a Christian framework. Hebrews and Exodus depict God as holy and powerful, as a consuming fire. God is pure and holy, so holy that the sound of his voice terrifies the Israelites, terrifies Moses. They beg for God to stop speaking because his word is just too holy for them to hear. God manifests his holiness in his law, which was meant to help Israel be holy too. God's power is intimately connected with his holiness. God's voice has the power to strike fear into the hearts of the Israelites precisely because his voice displays his holiness. Yet the Exodus narrative, filtered through Hebrews, also shows God relating to one nation in particular above all of the others. God chooses Israel at Sinai to be his people. He says that he will be their God and they will be his people. The law God gives at Sinai is meant, as I said, to make Israel holy, so that Israel's holiness might point everybody else to God's holiness. So we get a different picture of God in Hebrews than in Jeremiah, don't we? God is the God of all nations in Jeremiah, but in Hebrews, he plays favorites and picks the Israelites to be his chosen people. Hebrews implies that God chooses us too through Jesus Christ. But that's another sermon for another day. The third reading from Psalm 71 departs from Jeremiah and Exodus because it captures how God relates to one person alone. This psalm is a poem and a petition. The speaker begs God to be the sort of God he imagines him to be, the sort of God he's been for the speaker in the past. The first line of the psalm sums up what God has been for the speaker and how the speaker imagines God to be so now. In the NRSV translation that we read, God has been a refuge for the speaker. And the speaker desperately hopes he will be so again. The King James Version is for me, for whatever reason, just a bit more poignant. The speaker has put his trust in God. God for the speaker is the person most worthy of his trust. In both cases, in both translations, the speaker begs God not to let him down. Do not let me be put to shame. He reminds God how he has been his rock and his fortress, how he has been the one in whom the speaker hoped, the one he worshipped. And he bases his current requests to God. Deliver me, save me, rescue me, hear me on the basis of who God has been for him in the past. He would be ashamed if God didn't come through for him because he'd have to accept 
He never understood God at all. God in this psalm is the God of the individual. God is this person's rock, this person's fortress. We may share the psalmist's experience of God. God may be our rock and our fortress too. But the psalm is solely concerned with who God is for this particular person. It's tempting to dismiss these revelations of who God is because they're so personal. To suggest that God was only this person's rock and nobody else's. I think our experience of God in our lives quickly illustrates how foolish this idea is. But that idea also misses the whole point of the psalm. That God cares about the individual enough to be that person's God. God related to Jeremiah, but he wasn't Jeremiah's God. He was the God of the nations. God related to Moses, but he wasn't exactly Moses' God. He was the God of Israel. Yet here in the Psalms, God relates to the psalmist precisely because he is the psalmist's God. I resonate with this psalm so much because he's my God too. I suspect you may feel the same way. At this point, you may be noticing a problem. God isn't depicted in the same way in all of the texts we've read. God's circle of concern seems to be getting smaller and smaller and smaller. First, he's the God of the nations, then he's the God of a particular nation, and now he's a single poet's God. God is holy and powerful, but he's also a source of comfort and hope. God is concerned with all of humanity equally, but he's also the sort of God one might credibly ask to smite one's enemies. God's word is so holy, it terrifies people who have been enslaved for years, have seen the Red Sea parted, and have seen wonder after wonder. God's word is also proclaimed by a reluctant child, Jeremiah. In short, if we had to sum it all up, nothing about this God of ours seems to be consistent from one text to another, except that somehow we're talking about the same God. The reading from Luke, the, ra the last reading, exacerbates this problem so badly it actually solves it. If you thought things were bad before, try this out for size. God is a man. God is a man. The same word of God that spoke to Jeremiah, the same word of God that terrified the Israelites, is now a man. The same presence of God that could make Moses' face shine and could kill a man on contact now is a man in whose presence the woman is healed. The same God who created the world and endowed all things with life is now a man who will suffer and die on the cross. Who is this God? Yet, the fact that God became man solves our problem, too. In a strange way, God had to become something more simple for us to understand how complex and how awesome he really is. The strange thing is that we would readily concede that a human could be so complex. But we seem unwilling to concede that when it's God. Read the obituary, oops, sorry. <laughs> Read the obituary page in any newspaper. I'll just stipulate that way. People are physically intimidating, and yet they're incredibly gentle. They care for everyone, yet they seem to care for you 
just a little bit more. They are paragons of holiness and virtue. Their collar seems ever so starched. And yet they have the most hysterical sense of humor. We readily admit that we're complex creatures. That people can have qualities that seem to be in conflict, but yet aren't. God shows us that he is the same way. And to do it, he became a man. He had to become human to show us what God was really like. So I'll end this sermon as I did the last, with a couple of questions. Would you really want a God who is any less complex? Would you be able to trust a God that seems just a little bit less alive? a little bit less complex, a little bit less real than your neighbor who is sitting next to you in the pew? Would you fall down in worship before a God that could be completely captured in a tweet? Would we be able to know a God who never lived and walked among us? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.
As we come to the time of prayer, I refer you to the thoughts and prayers page. Uh, on uh, you can find that on the paper bulletin, on the app bulletin, um, and also it came in the email this morning. And if you did uh, receive it in the email this morning, you know that we have a couple of additional prayer concerns that are not listed in the printed bulletin, which went to print before those things happened. So I do want to uh, mention uh, ones that are in our bulletin. Um, we are in, uh, continuing in prayer for uh, Mandy, Jenny's friend, on the sudden death of her husband. Uh, she has a five-year-old uh, daughter and is expecting their second child in September. So. Um, please be in prayer for her. And uh, we're in prayer for Rosie, a uh, Tecla's friend who was widowed this year and who is uh, undergoing chemo and has other uh, struggles also in her life. We are uh, praying for the family and friends of Carl, uh, especially his wife, to Linda, a friend of Susan's. And uh, we're continuing to pray for Alec, who is in rehab, uh, recovering from an infection. And he is showing improvement, doing better. So continue to pray for him. Um, we do have two uh, new uh, prayer concerns. Uh, Shakti's father, Shaligram, is in uh, hospital, uh, recovering after surgery. Uh, he's actually uh, needed to have several surgeries over this week. And so it, he has a very long road ahead. And so we ask you to please pray for his continued improvement and for uh, that family. And I also um, bring you sad news this morning that Trinity's oldest member, uh, Carrie Barbie, died on Friday evening uh, at the age of 103 in wow. Bridgewater, Virginia. Uh, and that, the, You'll be receiving this information in an email. We will be having uh, a service here on next Monday, August 29th at 12 o'clock noon. Uh, the graveside service will be at 11, be prior to that service here. And there's also a visitation at Murphy Funeral Home uh, on Sunday, August 28th from 6 to 8. So you'll be receiving that information in an email, but I did want to uh, convey it this morning, uh, everything that I know uh, about that. Uh, I do want to say that she um, passed peacefully with her daughter by her side, and um, there were many blessings around that. So uh, I also uh, learned about one minute before walking into the sanctuary uh, that my uncle, um, Robert, um, passed away on Friday as well. So, thank you. Let us pray. O oh, divine voice, you sing and the universe comes into being. O oh, divine breath, you breathe and all things spring to life. O oh, divine word, you call and creation is sustained. O oh, divine flesh, you are born among us, and the Creator is clothed in creation. O oh, divine spirit, you fill all that has been formed. O oh, divine life, you are the pulse of all that is. God of grace, holy three in one, to a world that searches, you are a lamp that shines. To a world that is hungry, you are food that sustains. To a world that suffers, you are hope of release. To a world that's broken, you are one who restores. To a world full of hate, you are love that forgives. To a world that denies, you are truth that endures. 
And so in amazement and awe, in wonder and celebration, we marvel at this mystery. In you, all things live and move and have being. In all things, you live and move and express your divine artistry. Teach us to respect the fragile balance of life and to care for all the gifts of your creation. Guide by your wisdom those who have power and authority that by the decisions they make, life may be cherished and a good and fruitful earth may continue to show your glory and sing your praises. Be with our college students as they settle into another year or their first year. Be with Luke in his third year of seminary and in his discernment about the future. Hear our prayers now for those we know who are sick or who suffer in any way. Those who were mentioned this day, those whose needs are on our hearts. Grant healing, peace, comfort, direction. For those who mourn, immerse them in your love. We pray all these things in the name and spirit of Jesus who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Would you please stand and join me for our next hymn?
The psalmist praised God because he trusted him. And part of how we praise God is by returning to him our tithes and offerings. Let us do so now. Please pray with me. Accept our offerings, O oh God. May the Spirit's fire refine it for your service and always for your glory. Refine us also, setting us free to minister in your name. Amen. Would you please stand and sing with our contemporary band?
grateful for Stuart and for his ministry here among us. Thank you for bringing him here, especially for this time of challenge. Thank you for your gifts poured out on him, gifts that have been shared with us. God of new adventures, God of familiar places, we pray for Stuart and for Anna as they move to Richmond. Grant them soft landings, good, fruitful work, a sense of home in their new dwelling, 
and all other mercies they may need for the road ahead. Amen. Amen. Thank you. We worship a God we can't even fully comprehend. We worship a God whose word is terrifying and the most comfort we'll ever receive. We worship a God who appeared to us on a mountain and as a man. So go forth. Take his gospel out into the world. May the grace, mercy, and peace of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you this day and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Yeah.